Oh, now it seems to be working. Sorry for that. No problem. Okay, so uh, I will start with a short introduction uh, where I will review uh, some aspects of the KKLT scenario uh, that will be relevant for this talk. Then I will uh, explain what we call the singular bulk problem. I will also discuss uh, possible escape routes. And uh, finally, I will conclude with some remarks about uh, possible future research directions. All right, uh, so uh, yeah, as uh, all of you know, uh, there is a long debated question in the literature, uh, namely whether it is possible to have uh, desider vacua in string theory. On the one hand, uh, there are several plausible and popular uh, scenarios uh, for uh, desider constructions, um, such as the KKLT scenario or the large volume scenario. But uh, one should also say that they are not fully explicit at this point. On the other hand, uh, it is well known that there are many uh, no-go theorems uh, that uh, constrain uh, either the existence or the stability of the sitter space in various corners of string theory. So uh, I've just displayed two uh, classic papers here, but there are many more such papers. So there's a variety of no-go theorems which apply to specific situations and uh, exclude the possibility of, uh, of metastable desider vacua there. So um, one might wonder whether there could be such a thing as some uh, no desider conspiracy in string theory. <clears throat> and uh, in the recent years, uh, this idea has been formalized uh, in terms of, for example, the desider conjecture or the refined desider conjecture. Yeah, so uh, could something like this possibly be true? Um, well, I think it is fair to say that uh, at the moment uh, we don't know. So for this reason, it is crucial, I think, to keep trying to construct uh, explicit models that could possibly realize uh, these known uh, or proposed scenarios. But um, on the other hand, one should also be open to the possibility that there could be some uh, problems hiding in some details of the constructions. So uh, yeah, this is exactly what I would like uh, to do today. Uh, in particular, I would like to focus on the earliest and uh, probably most studied proposal, which is uh, the KKLT scenario. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, let me uh, review uh, quickly some aspects of this uh, scenario. So uh, the idea is to construct metastable desider vacua in three steps. The first step is uh, to consider some type 2b or more generally uh, F-theory flux vacua, which support a strongly warped throat. So this is what I've tried to draw in this cartoon here. And uh, this warped throat is locally modeled by the klebanov strassel sol solution. Um, it is characterized by some flux numbers, k and m, and uh, these fluxes, they carry a d3 charge, uh, k times m, and uh, in this talk I will just uh, call this number n. So there's some d3 charge dissolved in fluxes, and this charge is localized here at the tip somewhere. Um, the second step is to stabilize the killer modulus, uh, t, using some non-perturbative effects. Uh, so this could, uh, for example, be an uh, Euclidean D3 brain instanton, or it could also be a gay geno condensate of some stack of NC D7 brains. And one can argue that this uh, then leads to some supersymmetric ADS vacua with vacuum energy density uh, of uh, which scales uh, like this here. So e to the minus RET uh, divided by NC. So here um, in, this, um, in this equality here, I've um, ignored uh, any non-exponential effects that, uh, that appear in front of uh, the exponential function here. These are not displayed. Um, and for readability, I will also uh, neglect uh, order one numerical prefactors here in the exponent. Uh, if you're interested in those precise numbers, you can look uh, them up in our paper. But, uh, here, I will not uh, keep track of them as they won't be important for the argument. OK, so this is how the vacuum energy density scales. Um, and uh, let me, in the following, for simplicity, also set nc equals to 1. Uh, I will comment on the more general case where this is not equal to 1 later.
Okay, uh, the last step is then to uplift this uh, ADS minimum to the sitter by placing uh, one or several anti-D3 brains into the throat region. And uh, one can argue that due to the strong warping in this throat region, the energy density of these uh, brains, of these anti-brains is redshifted. So what you get is an uplift contribution to the vacuum energy, uh, which uh, goes like e to the minus k over gsm. K and m are again uh, the fluxes that I introduced uh, earlier. And um, yeah, this uplift uh, term leads to a metastable uh, de Sitter vacuum if the uplift energy is not too large. So what we want is that the uplift term is roughly of the same order as the ADS term. So many of you probably remember this potential here. So this is uh, the potential that leads to the uh, ADS minimum here. Uh, this is the, how the uplift term uh, goes. And when this uplift term becomes too large, then the sum of this term and this term uh, leads to a runaway in the killer direction. So this is not what we want. We also don't want it to be too small because then the sum doesn't lead to the sitter, but to ADS. So uh, what you need in the end is roughly that uh, this here is the same of the same order as this here. So uh, this leads exactly to this condition here that the uplift term uh, is of the same order of magnitude as the ADS term which translates then into this relation between these two exponentials. Okay, and when I just compare these uh, two exponents and use that n equals k times m, then I get uh, this condition here for the real part of the Kähler modulus. It has to scale like n over gsm squared in order for the uplift uh, to admit a metastable uh, decider minimum. Okay, uh, so we will uh, use this in the following. And uh, another thing that will be important for uh, this talk is that this uh, number uh, uh, GSM squared in the denominator is actually uh, large. Um, so how can this be motivated? Um, well, there are several bounds on, um, on this number. Um, for one thing, um, in order for the curvature uh, at the tip of the warped uh, deformed conifold to be small, we need GSM to be larger than order one. Then it has also been argued that M needs to be uh, roughly bigger than 12 in order um, to not have um, a nucleation of uh, NS5 brain bubbles that would lead to perturbative uh, instabilities. And uh, more recently, there has been a series of papers uh, which argued for an even stronger bound on GSM squared, um, uh, which is 6.8 squared, so roughly 46. And um, this argument is based on an instability of the conifold modulus that you would like to prevent. So the precise numbers uh, are not uh, going to be important in this talk, um, but I'm going to use that, uh, or I'm going to assume that uh, GSM squared and needs to be a large parameter. Okay, so um, last year there was an uh, interesting uh, paper by Kata et al, where they uh, made a very interesting observation, namely precisely in this regime of large GSM squared uh, that I want to focus on. When you um, compare the size of the strongly warped throat and the size of the calabiao, then it seems that this throat does not fit into the calabiao. It's just too large. And uh, yeah, the authors also suspected that this might lead to uh, singularities in the bulk. On the other hand, it's not really clear whether this is by itself really a problem, um, because what this estimate tells us is merely that uh, the assumption of uh, a distinction between a strongly warped throat region and a weakly warped Calabiao bulk uh, simply breaks down uh, at large GSM squared. So in other words, we would have a strongly warped compactification. And uh, strong warping a priori is by itself uh, not a control issue. Uh, it just means that the warp factor is not approximately constant, but it's a varying function uh, throughout the whole uh, uh, manifold. So, um, of course, a varying function can a priori still be positive and uh, energy densities could be small. So, uh, it's not clear whether uh, this is really uh, a problem for the control of this compactification. So, in principle, strong warping could be fine with a supergravity approximation. 
So what we would uh, need to do is we would need to study the warp geometry in more detail uh, in this regime of uh, GSM squared large. And um, yeah, this is uh, what I would like to do uh, in the following slides, um, unless there is a question so far. Okay, if not, uh, then I'll continue. Okay, so let me move on to uh, discuss in more detail uh, uh, our single or bulk problem. <clears throat> so uh, let me consider type 2b uh, on some conformally Calabiao or antifold um, with the following uh, string frame uh, metric. So this is the metric uh, that we consider. Um, so here, this is supposed to be the external uh, four-dimensional part with some uh, warp factor, which we denote by H. And uh, this is the internal six-dimensional part. Uh, it has some conformal factor here, and uh, there's a Ricci flat uh, metric factor, which we call tilde G, and which we normalize uh, to one. And uh, you may recall that the Kähler modulus T is defined uh, in terms of the Einstein frame four cycle volume wrapped uh, by the uh, Euclidean D3 brain uh, instanton. So uh, remember on one of the slides before, I had this relation that RET scales like N over GSM squared. Uh, and this I can relate to the DBI action of a Euclidean D3 brain wrapping uh, the four cycle. So uh, when I plug in this metric uh, into this DBI action, then what I find is a relation uh, of this uh, form here. So the warp factor integrated over this four cycle, let me just uh, call it sigma, uh, has to scale like n over uh, GSM squared. And I'm also going to string units here. Okay, so uh, another thing uh, I'm going to use is that one can relate the Calabiao volume and also the four cycle volumes uh, by the two cycle volumes using triple intersection numbers. And when one does that, then one can actually uh, relate the four cycle volume by the Calabiao volume. Um, and since uh, the Calabiao volume in the tilted metric, uh, since we normalize this to one, then by this formula here also the four cycle volume in, measured in this tilted metric will also be order one or bigger than order one in our normalization. So that's not a deep fact here. It's simply due to the fact that we normalize tilted GMN uh, such that uh, the Calabiao volume is one. Sorry, that, Daniel? Um, yes. Um, just something I didn't follow. Are you actually using DBI? Are you actually using the alpha prime corrections or just the leading order? In getting this relation? Yeah, so here I'm just uh, using the leading order approximation. So uh, the DBI action uh, is uh, the, the volume of that four cycle, which should be true at large volumes. Okay, and now I can, um, or, or were you asking about uh, uh, world volume flux uh, or other types of string corrections? Well, there's lots of string corrections, but I'm just wondering why um, the alpha prime corrections that give you DBI matter, as opposed to just the leading two derivative term in your in your Euclidean three brain. Yeah, this is just the this is just the the leading term, the DBI actions. Uh, uh, sorry. The yeah. So you. Direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's no. It's not really the square root that you're using, or you're using the full square root with the alpha prime corrections. Um, so you could incorporate the world volume flux, for example, where, where which is known to all orders, how this uh, appears in the square root, uh, but this actually makes the bounds stronger, so this doesn't help you. And then, of course, there could be other like curvature corrections to the DBI actions, but I think they will not be important at large volume, at least that's the assumption. I mean, that's what we would like, right, to get a reliable uh, construction. We would like to be at large volume where alpha prime corrections are not important in the construction. So we'd like to be in the supergravity approximation where curvature corrections are suppressed. I have a question, sorry, I didn't understand too well. Um, so the, vol the four cycle which is wrapped by this Euclidean three brain is where? I mean, because, you know, I, I mean, the, the, is it linked with the, with the two cycle of the Klebanov-Strassler or, you know, 
I'm just I'm just confused how that how, how do the GSM squared factors come in? Because you know this is a property of the throat. GSM squared is a property of the Klebanov Sosa throat. Well, the first cycle is somewhere you know on the Calabria or far away. Where yeah, so the thing is that in order um, to uh, have an, uh, a viable uplift, you need to relate the ADS vacuum energy density uh, to uh, the energy density of the brains and the throat. And this is how you get a relation between uh, properties of the warp factor in the bulk to uh, some stuff in the throat. And this is how um, the properties of the throat uh, uh, are relevant for the bulk. Uh, but if you have the hierarchy somewhere, because you know, if, if the throat is very long, you have some hierarchy. If you have some other throat, you have another hierarchy. So you know, if you look at, I mean, there should the, somewhere in this in this formula, there should appear the hierarchy between the bottom of the Klebanov-Strasser solution and the top of the Klebanov-Strasser solution. So what I'm just using here is that I want uh, the uplift uh, energy density not be too large. Uh, so uh, I have to uh, relate this to the ADS vacuum energy density. And uh, this is non-perturbatively generated, so it should go like e to the minus s, where s is the uh, DBI action of the E3 brain. Or you could really also express it in terms of the Kähler modulus. And here, this is just the, uh, the exponential suppression of the warp factor at the tip of the throat. And when you relate these two things, then you get that these exponents have to equal. If they don't, uh, then uh, you either get a runaway uh, if the uplift is too large or if it's too small, then you don't get this other. I see. So you have the hierarchy in the in this formula. Okay. Okay. So where was I? Here, right? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So on the one hand, we have this uh, relation here uh, that tells us um, about the integral of H over this four cycle, uh, which has to go like uh, N over M squared when I cancel this GS factory on both sides. And then I also have this um, uh, statement here that tells me that uh, the four cycle volume as measured with tilde G has to be uh, order one or bigger in our normalization. And uh, now I can just divide this by this here to uh, get uh, a relation uh, for the warp factor averaged over that cycle sigma. So here I'm using uh, this definition of the average. So I'm integrating H over the four cycle and divide by the four cycle volume. So what this tells me is that uh, the average warp factor over this four cycle needs to be of the order n over m squared. And this again just follows from uh, uh, the requirement that this uplift term uh, is not too large. Okay, so we have this relation for the average warp factor. And uh, now this of course implies that there must be somewhere a neighborhood on this four cycle sigma where H is actually equal to or smaller than N over M squared because otherwise we could not achieve this average. On the other hand, we also know that the warp factor uh, satisfies a Poisson equation. Uh, that's just um, uh, the solution uh, of, uh, of this background. Um, and this Poisson equation uh, looks like this. Uh, we have nabla squared h equals minus gs times some d3 charge uh, density. And uh, here by d3 charge density, uh, I mean uh, to include everything that carries d3 charge. So this could be actual d3 brains, it could be O planes, it could be seven brains carrying d3 charge, it could be, or it, it includes fluxes carrying d3 charge. So anything that uh, contributes to the D3 charge density will be present in, in this uh, tilde row here. And um, yeah, this acts as a source for the warp factor. Okay, so, um, and uh, if you recall what I said in the beginning, we have this uh, D3 charge uh, N sitting at the tip of the conifold uh, and uh, through the Poisson equation, this, uh, back reacts on the warp factor and leads to a variation of the warp factor of the order GSN uh, if I'm at an order one distance uh, until the G. Uh, GSN simply because the GS is the coupling here and N is the charge. But this so equation is only valid for super symmetric. The way that uh, the warp factor will vary of the order GSN. Sorry? This equation is only valid for the for the supersymmetric solution, and you know you cannot apply it for the anti defibrance at the tip because anti defibrance changes supersymmetry completely. This equation well, with the warp factor, the warp factor, anti brain yet. So uh, I'm I'm considering step one basically. 
In step one, I just want to prepare a, a flux compactification, which has the right properties to later admit the uplift. Okay, so I want a flux compactification, which on the one hand has a charge N sitting in the KS throat. Ah, but the charge N is not sitting at the tip. The charge N is sitting throughout the throat. And if you actually look at the integral of the charge resulting fluxes, it's not localized at the tip. You have a charge resulting fluxes all the way in the, in, in, I mean, the, the charge is all the way in the manifold, in, in, the, in the KS throat. It's not, it's not living at the tip of the, of the, of the KS throat. Um, well, um, it is it is not a delta function. Uh, it's not a like a D three brain, but um, I mean the flux density is smooth. I mean, that's probably what you mean. But it falls yes. off. So, but you know we don't know. Actually, it it can be that mo most of the charge comes from the junction between the throat and the calabiao, and not from the tip. It doesn't no, need to see the tip. Um, of you the can edge. look at the explicit solution and and see how it uh, how it falls off. As you also know, uh, far away from the throat, actually, the warped uh, uh, conifold looks like uh, Klevonov's cyclin. So it's uh, basically, it, it looks the same from far away. So uh, I think it has the properties um, to look exactly like a localized source when you are far away. Then, I mean, the only thing is you have a small deformation uh, at the tip. So when you are an order one uh, distance away, when measured in with uh, tilde G, then you expect uh, the same order of variation as you had for an actual uh, stack of D3 brains, uh, of ND3 brains. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a correct statement. Because of the log, you're saying because of the log. So in Klebon or Cycling, there's a one, one over R to the four and there's a log R and you're saying that the log R is very weak. Um, yeah, exactly. There, there are some log corrections, but they don't really matter much. I mean, you can you can check for the explicit uh, solution of the deformed conifold and evaluate at some order one distance. If, if you so like the order one is what? You Sorry, order one then you, then you see that uh, the variation of the warp factor at such a distance is actually of the order GSM. And how can I think about order one? Is it order one away from the, so you, you, you are at the bottom, there's a Klebanov Sasser tip, which has like, you know, one length, you know, it's like, you know, 10 kilometers. And then order one means what, 10 kilometers away? Or, you know, is it the place where Klebanov cycling kicks in? Or how, how can I think about order one? In the KS solution, if I just know KS, where is this order one place? I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, I think it's a well-defined statement to ask about distances as measured in the tilted metric. Um, that's not coordinate dependent or anything. I, mean, hmm. I think it's order one in the Calabi-Yau. You should think about it away from the throat. Oh, it's away from the throat. OK. I see, I see. I thought it was deep down the throat, somewhere between the clip no, no, no. outside the throat. So oh, it's outside the throat. Okay, okay, okay. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I didn't. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Uh, so where was I? Um, okay. So we we had um, this uh, relation here. Um, so this is our our proxy for defining what we mean by variation of the warp factor, uh, and we've argued that this is of the order GSN. And on the other hand, we also know that we have this uh, neighborhood on sigma where uh, h itself has to be smaller than or equal to n over m squared. So we can combine this into uh, this inequality here. And uh, yeah, what this tells us is that there uh, must be some region on sigma where the variation of h is much larger than h itself. Uh, in particular, it's proportional to this number gsm squared, which we argue to be large. And uh, yeah, now we can uh, use uh, this inequality uh, to just pick some point, uh, let me call it uh, y not, uh, somewhere in this neighborhood where this holds, and then just go a little uh, bit away from it. And uh, using this inequality, then uh, what we can see is uh, that there must be uh, some point uh, nearby where we hit uh, zero and actually the warp factor goes negative. So um, because of uh, this large variation of H compared to H itself, uh, it just goes negative somewhere in this neighborhood. All right, so before uh, I uh, continue to talk a bit more about the singularity, uh, let me just uh, recap uh, what I've uh, tried to argue for uh, so far. So um, step one of the KKLT proposal, uh, as I've said before, uh, requires a flux compactification where the volume modulus is stabilized at a relatively uh, small uh, value um, of the order n over gsm squared. 
And we also need a conifold region uh, where uh, some D3 charge N uh, is uh, dissolved in the fluxes. And uh, what, I, what I showed in the last slide is that uh, this value of the volume modulus that I need uh, is actually too small relative to this charge N uh, to ensure small curvature in the bulk. Instead, what we find is that uh, the D3 charge uh, creates a variation of the warp factor, which is so large that singularities are created. Okay, so that is the basic idea. Daniel, can I ask a question here? Yes. Um, so how important it is to make this linear approximation of the variation of the warp factor? Um, so for instance, if you have an exponential function, you can have large variation at all orders in derivative, but an exponential function never crosses zero. Um, so uh, what uh, we assume in this argument is that um, the warp factor is some uh, some factor GSN times uh, an order one function. So by order one function, I mean a function that varies of order one at an order one distance scale. And then I think it is safe to make this approximation here because we are just going uh, parametrically a small distance away from the point that I want to uh, consider. Um, in principle, you might uh, like think of, I guess you're thinking of some uh, function that like fluctuates very heavily uh, around the average uh, and then it can still vary a lot, but uh, never hit zero. I mean, this is very ungeneric. Um, I think with, with parametric estimates uh, like this, one cannot exclude such crazy functions. Um, so I or cannot exclude that there are exponential uh, weird functions. models which, which do this. Sorry? Yeah, I was not thinking about highly fluctuating function, but something like an exponential. I mean, if it doesn't uh, fluctuate highly, then it will just go, uh, it will just drop to zero, right, in one direction. But isn't it? In the case that it just your approximation breaks down, you just can't do an expansion because if like the leading term in an expansion is becoming the same size as the tree level term, which it, which it has well, to expansion. What are you talking about? Just as h plus del m h delta y, you're saying that the distance delta y, the second term becomes as big as the first term. No, otherwise, how can it go negative? Um. Yes. So what you're saying is that uh, the whole uh, expansion could break down uh, and there's, I mean, this again would mean uh, that there is no, um, that the function, uh, I, mean, I have a, let me just go to the next slide, it's better. So, so this is what we have in mind, right? So uh, we have a function that uh, varies of the order GSN, but its average is very small compared to that variation. So when I go a little bit uh, away from uh, the neighborhood where I know that it's of the order N over M squared, then it becomes uh, smaller and hits zero. Of course, you could uh, think about some function that like oscillates very quickly around this minimum here, then this would also vary of the order GSN and but not hit zero. But uh, first of all, this is very ungeneric. And uh, second of all, one can actually see from the walk factor equation that H cannot have any minima. So you can never achieve this in all directions. There must be a direction where starting from a point where it equals n over m squared, there, there must be a direction in which you go negative. You cannot avoid this by having special functions that you know just go a little bit negative and then turn up again. Does it's just, it's just a general thing. It's hard to see. If you start with a tree level term and then you do an expansion. And then you say that the first the expansion term becomes the same order of magnitude as the tree level piece. That usually means expansion is broken down. Uh, and you have to include Aaron, that's just Taylor, a Taylor series. It's a Taylor series which yeah, I normalized by a constant such as the first term is small. That doesn't make the Taylor series break down. Yeah, I mean, uh, think of a function where the first term is just zero. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the convergence rate is just zero. So uh, I don't think that's correct. I mean, the first term of the expansion here is just very small, but that doesn't mean that when the first two terms are of the same order, the expansion breaks down. So the, the, the first term is much bigger than the tree level term, but then the second term is a bit smaller than the first term. This is what the expansion you have in mind. Yeah, so again, I'm assuming uh, a function that varies of an order one uh, scale uh, on an order one distance scale. So when I just, uh, 
consider very small deviations, which are parametrically smaller than order one, then I expect that I can safely use a Taylor expansion. Okay, thank you. I have another question. You're making the assumption that the four cycle, which is wrapped by the D3 brains, go near, goes nearby the region where the Klebanostraster throat sits. But this assumption is not, right? I mean, in the previous page. There. So there's a D3 brain which goes around, which gives you the, which wraps this four cycle, which gives you this very happy thing, or you can put some D7 brain. But you're assuming that this D7 brain actually sits nearby the region of the Klebanostraster throat. But those things can, can sit oh, very sorry, far away on the Calabiao. Sorry? I don't assume that. Why do you say that? Because, you, you know, it, it essentially, the equation which you have with the D3 charge density, I mean, you know, the equation, uh, the, 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 I mean, the one below. Yeah, that one and the one below. <laughs> They are just valid around the Klebanostraster throat. And the D7 brain, which has gauge genome condensation or the D3 brain wrapping the Euclidean instanton, this can happen very, very far away in the other corner of the Calabiao without even, without yeah, having any idea. Far away in the tilted metric means order one. Uh, so recall, I, I uh, normalized this tilted metric factor such that its volume is one. So the most far away you can go is order one. So order one means I'm already far away. So you are saying that the Klebanostraster tip actually affects the whole Calabiao, and you know essentially there's no way to there's no way to move away from it. it there's no way to separate. You know there's no way to put some D7 brain far away and to have the Klebanostraster tip some other region, and you know to have them not talk to each yeah, other. Yeah, precisely because uh, the volume uh, that you need for the uplift to work is just too small. If I made the volume modulus say of the order n squared or n cubed or so, then of course I'm fine. Then I have a very nice uh, GKP compactification, but such a compactification won't be good for KKLT uplift. And that's, oh, okay, this is interesting, okay. So you're saying that you cannot put a December far away. I mean, everything must be in the vicinity of the tip of the throat. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we agree on what we mean by vicinity, but um, it the is such where, that... the, where the second equation from the bottom holds. I mean, you know, this order of one distance in G tilde. This one. Yeah. Uh, if you mean by vicinity that the variation of the warp factor due to the D3 charge in the throat is large even in the bulk, uh, then yes. yes, I agree, then it's in the vicinity. Uh huh. Okay. But then I, how can I stop this charge? Because I mean, this charge, I mean, there's a tadpole, right? And this tadpole has to be eaten up somehow. And, you know, I mean, you, you have to, I mean, there's some other place in the Calabio where this has to be eaten up, some orientifolds or some other. Um, yeah. So, um, Generically, you would expect that these O planes, uh, they are scattered through the box somehow, um, and then this won't help you much. Uh, I will briefly mention some possible escape routes uh, uh, further to the end. Uh, so you could certainly uh, think about specific uh, O plane configurations where, for example, the O planes are located in such a way that they effectively screen the charge from the throat, uh, but this mm -hmm. is, I think, very ungeneric. So it's an interesting question for model building if this can be done but I think it's not a generic case. Mm -hmm. Okay. May, may I ask you a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, sorry, maybe I didn't get it. So uh, how much uh, uh, does what you say depend on the, the compactification of the internal space? So what, what happens if you try to decompactify the internal space, you go back to the Clebron structure solution and so you don't see any, any of these uh, singularities. Actually, the warp factor increases, no? So I guess by compactifying, you mean you keep uh, the charge fixed and then you would like to increase the volume to infinity somehow? Okay, if you want to keep the charge fixed, you mean the, the, the differ brain charge, the, uh, I want uh, the, the, the different fixed. brain charge will increase. Now in the Klebanov's faster solution, you know that you have this duality cascade that you see some uh, infinite uh, charge. Well, I'm not sure which limit you want to take. Let's say, let's say uh, I have this uh, GKP compactification with some... No, no, no. Trust, uh, is a non-compact solution, which clearly does not lead to, to a gravity in fourth dimension, but uh, can be regarded as some kind of, uh, I mean, dual to a fourth dimensional... Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure in which sense or, or what would be the what would be the problem there? I mean, what, what I'm doing here is I want a, a specific, I fix a specific value uh, of the volume based on uh, pheno requirements in particular that I want this to sit or uplift. And this then leads to a problem. If I start from a non-compact solution in the first place, then 
Yeah, I was just I trying to understand it. where in some imagining to, to, to be able to, to go to some decompactification limit in which you recover the carbon stress, where can you see the emergence of this singularity? Because you have this negative work factor and your analysis looks completely local in a certain sense, uh, in, in some aspects, in some others, no. But uh, so I was wondering if you can, uh, if you can see uh, gradually, no? You, you say, okay. You that's why I was asking how we want to take the limit. Uh, so uh, if you take oh, yes. the limit just by increasing n, uh, then the volume becomes larger, but the charge in the throat becomes larger at the same time. So the, uh, it's not the actual large volume limit and the problem persists. If you keep the charge fixed, uh, so the tadpole n fixed, but then increase the volume modulus, uh, then at some point you will go into a regime where you are very weakly warped, and then you have an approximate calabi with just very tiny warping corrections. But such a compactification, that's what I was saying before, uh, it would not be viable for the uplift. So uh, in this limit of going to larger and larger volumes, at some point the problem will vanish. But you cannot take this limit in KKLT, that's the point. Okay, thank you. Not sure if this answers the question, but okay. All right, now I have to remember which slide I was. Okay, so this one we finished. Okay, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more about um, how the singularity looks like. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, how large do we generically expect this a singular region to be? And uh, yeah, as I've told you before, uh, the variation of the warp factor is much larger uh, than uh, its average uh, near sigma. And uh, so uh, I've tried to uh, draw this here uh, in this uh, cartoon here. So uh, the average is very small, uh, but then the variation is very large. So um, generically, uh, this can only work if there's an order one fraction of the E3 volume, again, as measured in tilde G, if an order one fraction of this volume uh, has a, a negative region. If this is only a, a tiny region here and then it goes up again, um, then the average would be way, way too large. So uh, yeah, so along the E3 volume, uh, we expect an order one fraction to be singular. And then generically, we also uh, expect that uh, into the transverse space, uh, the singularity will spread uh, at an order one distance. So by generically uh, here, I mean uh, that uh, I don't want uh, the warp factor, uh, or I assume that the warp factor does not vary parametrically stronger along the transverse direction than it does along the parallel directions. Uh, if, if this were true, then the singularity could be like ungenerically thin. But if I assume that's not the case, uh, then uh, an extension uh, over an order one distance along uh, sigma will mean that it also extends along an order one fraction in the transverse directions. So uh, again, these are uh, arguments based on parametric uh, estimates and on genericity, uh, it might be possible to come up with specific geometries which somehow avoid these parametric conclusions and then the singularity might be smaller or thinner or whatever. But I think uh, this is the, the generic uh, expectation based uh, on what we know. Okay, um, uh, I can also make a complementary argument uh, that looks at this from a somewhat different perspective. Uh, so in particular, uh, let me consider a coarse grained warp factor, which I will denote by HC. <clears throat> and for simplicity, let me also uh, restrict here uh, to the case where the tadpole uh, is canceled by O3 planes. So these are then just some point-like sources here, which are scattered over the Calabial and they have some average distance which I denote by DO3. And uh, let me consider a situation where I uh, um, consider a coarse graining scale D, which is uh, much larger than this average O3 distance, but at the same time, uh, much smaller than uh, uh, the size of this uh, Calabiao. Again, I'm, I'm measuring until the G here. So what I end up with uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this thought experiment uh, is a coarse grained D3 charge distribution. Um, in particular, I have a positively charged lump uh, with charge plus N, which sits at the tip of the conifold as before, but now it is spread over some diameter D. 
And uh, since I chose my coarse graining scale to be uh, large compared to the average O3 distance, uh, uh, the uh, negative charge density uh, that these O3 planes provide uh, will be uh, uniform. So uh, as you can see in this picture here, this is the idea. We have a warp factor, um, which has uh, some negative spikes due to local divergences associated to these O3 planes. So the warp factor goes down here and then maybe here again and here again. Um, so we have all these uh, local features, but then I have some coarse grained warp factor uh, with coarse graining scale much larger than this distance here. And this coarse grained warp factor will uh, approximately follow uh, the maxima of H and uh, not see these, uh, these local spikes here. And now, um, the interesting point is that uh, one can again repeat the same argument that we did before for this coarse grained uh, warp factor. Uh, and in particular, uh, if one does that, one finds that again, we get an inequality of this, uh, 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 of this type here. And then you see that generically, even the coarse grained warp factor will go down and um, it will uh, feature some, some large singular regions uh, on this Calabiao. Okay. Sorry, just, just to understand the interpretation of the singularity, is this just a breakdown of the alpha prime expansion or something more? Um, um, I guess uh, you would see this as a breakdown of the alpha prime expansion. Um, the question is what, what happens uh, if you include these, these corrections? Uh, I mean, the point is that we completely lose control over the supergravity approximation, right? So. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, that in this region where the warp factor goes negative, there's some stuff happening. I mean, the, the volume, the curvature goes large before it actually becomes complex. So something stringy could happen there, we don't know. But uh, I think it would be quite miraculous if uh, all, the, all this stuff, all this uncontrolled stuff that will happen in the singular region would just like cancel out even after breaking supersymmetry, and then in the end, the decider minimum would survive without any uh, corrections, right? So I think that's the idea. Um, so you simply lose um, control because you lose the supergravity approximation. There's something about the O planes. So when, example, when you have, for example, O6 planes, when you go to them, there's a charge which is negative. So you know, if I put the word factor at, at an O6 plane, I get like, you know, again, all these spikes which cause, which seem to cause a problem. However, if I uplift to, to M theory, those six planes just become um, 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 and spaces. And I know that there the word factor is smooth. So somehow when I go to M theory, for example, I see that all the spikes which appear to be there in the type two, in, in the type two a supergravity approximation, actually they are resolved by these M theory effects and you don't actually don't have any spikes. You just have nice smooth, I mean, you know, if you imagine like, you know, a bunch of six planes on the line, when you uplift them, you get some Atiyah Hitchin spaces which have overall negative, negative mass, negative charge. But there are no spikes. The spikes are, are just eaten up. So the question is, you know, maybe for the O3 planes, a similar thing will happen, which, okay, we, don't, we cannot do in supergravity, but. Right. I mean, uh, I think most of us believe that O3 plane singularities are fine in string theory. I mean, um, we know that they exist, o, o planes exist as uh, objects in string theory. So we expect that these singularities are totally okay. Like, why can't you have more? Local features of the, of the geometry where our approximation breaks down, but. Uh, uh, I think we believe that this is still fine. Um, but what we are saying is that uh, in a generic compactification, we will have a, a large scale singularity, which, uh, which just makes the, the whole compactification space singular basic, basically. And uh, uh, a lot of features of this compactification space will just hide behind the singularity. So you just completely lose control. So it's not just a, a tiny little uh, region uh, in your compactification space where you might argue that I don't care from the point of view of the 4D low energy theory if there is a tiny region on my compact space where supergravity breaks down and where I know a string theory object sits. Why would I care if I'm just interested in the low energy effective field theory? This will just but if average of three distance, is it in the warped metric or in the unwarped metric? Sorry, can you say again? The, the average O3 distance, which you are taking there, is it in the warped metric? I'm just wondering, you know, okay, it's, so let's, let's, let's suppose you have an unwarped space. You have some O3s, which are some distances, you know, you, you get this average O3 distance. But then when you put the warping, you may actually get more, 
I mean, because of the warping, more of your orthreads can actually be next to your source, next to your cable of Sasa throat. And they might actually do a shielding of the type which, I'm just wondering if this, so this distance should not be in the, I mean, should be uh, in the unwarped space, I guess, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess you can you can compute whatever you want. Uh, so uh, here I've uh, chosen to uh, display distances in the tilted metric, mainly because uh, we also talked about sizes of singularities, and this doesn't really make sense in the in the conformal metric because uh, there the warp factor just goes negative, so distances become complex and so on. So I, I cannot meaningfully speak about uh, sizes and so on anymore when I'm interested in these singular regions. That's why I chose to write everything uh, in terms of the tilde G metric. Uh, but that's just, uh, in general, of course, you can compute distances in any metric you like. Uh, you just have to pay attention to what your uh, conclusions are. No, the, the only question is whether the density, whether the density of the Klebanov Sasta throat is going to affect is going to affect the distribution of your of your O3 planes. You know, why can why can't you get more O3 planes next to the Klebanov Sasta throat, which are going to shield your your singularity? That's basically the question. Can this happen? I mean, I don't know. I'm just I'm just asking. I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't done the calculation, so. So I, I think you would need to have this. Um, you ne would need to see the screening effect in the tilted metric, actually. Um, so you would want that in the tilted uh, metric, you have uh, charges placed in such a way that uh, they shield the, the charge from the-, uh, from the I see, and I think that, that generically- this Basically you have it. this, sorry, you have this Poisson equation, and this is also formulated in the tilted metric, right? So mm -hmm. maybe I don't know about uh, warping and uh, I don't know, gravity and whatnot. I just know that I have a function defined on- I see, I see, I see, I see. And you're saying that generically the O3s, the, the distance between the O3s is, is, is going to be something which depends on G tilde and not on the warping. And therefore there should be an equal distance in the O3. That makes, in the tilde metric, this makes sense actually. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, so let me maybe also uh, discuss a, a simple toy model. Um, which um, illustrates uh, the, the general idea um, of, of this uh, whole thing. So uh, instead of a Calabiao, um, let me just uh, consider a compact space, which is a six sphere. And let me parameterize uh, the six sphere with some polar angle phi, which goes from uh, zero to pi. And I will model the uh, charge in the Klebanov of stressor throat just by a point like source with charge n, which I put at phi equals zero, so here. And um, of course, I also need to satisfy uh, the tadpole condition, so I need to satisfy Gauss law. So I will model uh, the O planes, which usually uh, do this by adding some uniform uh, negative charge density. And uh, then uh, the Poisson equation that we saw before uh, when I plug in this metric uh, of the S6, then uh, it just reduces to uh, something like this, uh, which depends only on, on one uh, coordinate phi. And here on the right-hand side, I see my point-like uh, source with charge n that I just introduced. And this here is a term uh, which is a, a homogeneous negative charge density. Um, you can integrate here over the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and uh, you can verify that actually both sides vanish as they should. Now, um, one can actually solve this equation explicitly. I'm not going to do this here, uh, but uh, the solution is then, um, again, uh, some order one function h naught uh, multiplied by gsn plus some integration constant. And again, by order one function, I mean a function that is... Uh, that takes order one values and varies over order one at an order one distance scale. Um, so this is the function that one gets. It uh, falls off monotonically. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it takes some order one values, uh, except very close here to zero, where it diverges like one over phi to the four. And um, yeah, we also need some analog of the Kähler moduli stabilization. And uh, we do that by just uh, fixing this integration con constant by some condition on H uh, at the uh, quote unquote instanton position, phi equals phi E3. So uh, by here in this toy model, uh, this is just some condition that we introduce by hand. So we just say, let's pick some uh, position uh, on, this, uh, on this range here and say that uh, h at this position has to equal n over m squared. 
Uh, so this would be the analog of what we had before that we have uh, H averaged over this uh, four cycle rep by the instanton has to equal N over M squared. So here, this is just uh, one position since uh, the, the, the function just depends on, on one angle fine. And uh, yeah, when you do that, then you see that uh, uh, here you have this uh, function that falls off. And since uh, it varies uh, uh, by a rather large amount, but has to be fixed uh, to some rather small value here, then it actually goes through zero and uh, uh, becomes negative in a significant part of this, uh, of this space. So of course, that's uh, just a toy model. We know in reality, we have a Calabi-Yau and in reality, we also cannot just fix by hand uh, uh, the instanton position. Uh, but I think the key features of what is going on in the real case is uh, nicely displayed by this toy model. In particular, what we believe is the key issue is um, this large variation of the warp factor and the fact that it needs to um, have uh, rather small values somewhere on the bulk. So, so Daniel, is another interpretation of what you're saying, not that the alpha prime expansion breaks down, but that Kähler moduli stabilization is inconsistent? In the sense uh, yeah, of exactly. Having... In order to have consistency, you would want to stabilize it at a much larger value than is required by KKLT. I think, yeah, one can phrase it like that. So if you, if you tune the coefficient of the instanton, uh, the prefactor in front of your exponential, could you achieve that? If you just made up a number, for example, well, a very, a very it tiny was number, exponential, say. then yes, but uh, I guess that's not expected, right? So, so you expect that you don't have any exponentially large or small uh, things uh, next to your actual exponential. Hmm. I think I the problem is the problem is that you need a large number to save the model, and how do you tune it for a large number? That's I think difficult. Some exponentially large number as the prefactor of the. Of yes, the, yes, yes, yes. A the small number I may to make buy, it balanced. but a large yeah. number is difficult. Mm -hmm. I have another question. If you actually use the seven brains for engaging a condensation, in a sense, you could be saying I have the same problem because you know you have to look at the action of the seven brains and you know you have to evaluate the four cycle and you get the same answer for the value of the for, for this value, right? But on the other hand, the seven brains which are wrapping a four cycle which has some semi reasonable Euler number. Um, they actually have negative charge on themselves because you know they actually act as sources for negative charge because of the Euler number of the four cycle they're wrapping. So there's a question whether if you use the seven brains as, and not um, and not the three brain instantons, and again the seven brains are themselves a charge of negative or of negative um, a source of negative D three charge. Maybe they can self shield themselves from this from this Klebanov-Strasser effect, and then you know things can be happy there. I'm just wondering, I mean, I mean, nobody has built a local model of that, but you know, it'd be interesting to build it because you know, they can, I mean, they have, they definitely source a big negative D3 that well. I mean, and actually one of our arguments in the paper with Mariana and Severin and Emilian has been that, you know, essentially you need to get 500 units of tadpole from the Klebanostraster throat. So this N has to be about 500. And therefore this cannot come from all three planes. It has to come from the seven brains. Uh, there's no way to get it from some other sources. So in a sense, you could say that maybe I'm, I get these D seven brains, which do my gene condensation to stabilize my flux, to, to stabilize my Kähler moduli, but in the same time, this they serve as negative, as, as tadpole negative, as negative tadpole um, sources, and somehow maybe they shield themselves and you know somehow they cancel this problem. I'm just wondering. I'm just I'm just bringing this um, up. Yeah, so uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I think uh, generically our argument will also go through uh, when you include. Uh, uh, charged uh, seven brains, uh, but there could certainly be uh, specific situations like the one you mentioned where uh, you have um, maybe a, a, a D seven brain with, uh, with a large uh, negative charge close by or even on top of the instanton where you might be able to uh, make uh, things work out in such a way that uh, these large singularities uh, become smaller. Um, if the instanton sits directly on, on top of such a singularity, um, I wouldn't know how to do this technically. Maybe somebody else does because I mean, the warp factor just diverges. So basically uh, if you just naively plug this uh, into the instanton action, then you just get a divergent result. So you would have to regularize or subtract some of the divergent uh, part. Uh, I'm not sure how to do this uh, in a technically meaningful way, but uh, it's something that we thought a bit about and uh, would be interesting to understand this better. Well, you could, you, you could have done this in M theory with no discussion of 
seven planes and O seven 7 planes, O three 3 planes, it would have been just some geometric source. And, and there, uh, all of Yosef's questions could just be answered in terms of what kind of geometries could you engineer? And how does the, the, the negative charge distribution look? In that case, well, membrane that charge distribution. The problem is I have no idea how to do gauge genome condensation in M-theory. I mean, you know, I need to do some D7 brains back reacting and I don't know how to do that in M-theory. No, you, you, you would smooth it. You would smooth it, but you would still get the same super potential contribution. You would appealionize the problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are certainly, um, uh, let's say, uh, interesting questions left for model builders to just look at whether there could be uh, specific models um, which have certain O-plane arrangements or uh, a certain specific geometry where our parametric estimates are avoided for some reason. Um, so uh, I should again say that uh, uh, we use uh, a parametric estimate and this, uh, uh, these arguments hold generically, but uh, of course with such a type of argument, uh, one cannot by definition exclude specific arrangements where uh, these parametrics are avoided. I will also uh, uh, <clears throat> talk a bit more about this on the next slide, but um, yeah, so that's definitely an interesting question for the future. But I think generically our arguments do hold both for all three planes and also in a more general case where you have uh, the three brain charge uh, uh, on the world volume of some uh, the seven brains or all seven planes. Okay, so uh, let me uh, say also a few words uh, more about uh, possible escape routes. Um, yeah, uh, we've already discussed this actually, uh, as I just said, um, one thing uh, that is um, uh, possible that we cannot exclude and which would be interesting to, uh, to, to understand better and maybe do some uh, scans of uh, explicit models. Uh, could there be some special geometries uh, which for some reason avoid our parametric estimates? And uh, there's uh, one example that I've uh, drawn here in this cartoon that uh, uh, Josef, I think, uh, already mentioned uh, earlier, um, namely that uh, the O3 planes are, uh, have this special configuration um, such that they uh, shield or screen uh, this charge in the, in the throat. And then in the bulk, you would just have a weakly uh, varying warp factor. Um, and then um, there would presumably be no problem. So that would be very interesting if one could uh, find such a model. Um, other uh, possibilities are that for some reason there are regions in the bulk uh, in this uh, in such a geometry um, where um, the warp factor varies much more strongly or much more weakly than one would expect. Um, and then maybe the instanton is localized at precisely such a location to ensure that somehow the inequalities uh, are violated. So um, I think uh, uh, there's a, a lot that one can uh, still think about. Um, it seems uh, kind of uh, contrived, but uh, I cannot exclude it. So it would be interesting to think about this further. Uh, another point uh, that I have not discussed uh, so far is the possibility that one could have gate genome condensation with a large uh, stack uh, of uh, D7 brains. So this number NC that I set to one earlier uh, would be uh, much larger than one. And uh, if you uh, recall in the beginning, I had uh, this uh, scaling here of the uh, ADS vacuum energy density, uh, which uh, goes like e to the minus RET over NC. And if I just uh, repeat the derivation uh, the, or the argument that I did before, but now keeping NC, uh, then one sees that this inequality that I had uh, actually gets this extra factor in the denominator. So in principle, by choosing large NC, one could uh, make this uh, number here on the right-hand side small and then alleviate the problem. Um, however, uh, there was this uh, paper a few years ago um, where the authors um, did a scan of a large number uh, of Calabi-Yau models. And what they found is actually that uh, this number NC uh, seems to be uh, bounded. Um, in fact, it is bounded by some order 10 number times uh, H11. So the number of uh, kilo moduli. Um, yeah, so the D7 tadpole uh, is just uh, bounded apparently by this number. 
And uh, so when you have a simple model with just a single Kähler modulus, then you cannot make NC arbitrarily large. So you can at best uh, alleviate the problem a bit, but you cannot escape it parametrically. And um, yeah, for this reason, uh, it is interesting to look into models with uh, several Kähler moduli. And I'm not going uh, to discuss the technical details here. Uh, if you're interested in this, we have a very long section uh, where we go through several possibilities. Uh, Sorry, can you tell us where the type of condition come from the seven brain that work that you mentioned? What was the constraint? Where did they get that constraint? The two, um, so, the so uh, if I remember correctly, they just uh, did a large scan of, uh, of uh, different models and then they looked at what the tadpole for the for the D7 tadpole is. Uh, and they always found that it is never parametrically larger than some order 10 number times the number of Kähler moduli. So in principle, there could be models not included in the set studied by those people uh, which could avoid this, uh, but uh, I don't remember which, which number of models they actually looked at, but it was a huge number. So it's uh, in some sense an experimental result, uh, not a proof. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we, we um, studied several variants of KKLT uh, for models with several Kähler moduli and um, uh, all of the models that we studied uh, seemed to still have a singular bulk problem. Uh, there was only uh, one uh, exception that we could not exclude parametrically, uh, in particular when you consider a model with parametrically large uh, H11, which uh, uh, is of the order GSM squared to the three over five, and at the same time have a large order H11 D7 stack on almost all of these four cycles, um, then we were not able to infer a problem anymore. Um, the reason is a bit technical. Uh, as I said, I, I don't want to go here into the details, but if you're interested, you can uh, look it up in our paper. Um, so what you would need in the end is a tadpole uh, of the order H11 squared. Um, Again, interesting question uh, for model builders to perhaps do a scan and uh, look for models which have such a large tadpole. I don't know if this is possible. So that's uh, also an interesting open question. Um, it certainly uh, looks uh, quite contrived, this model, but uh, uh, I don't know if such large tadpoles uh, are possible or not. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, let me conclude. So um, I argued that flux compactifications uh, admitting a KKLT like the sitter uplift uh, will generically have large singularities that extend uh, over an order one fraction of the uh, original Calabi-Yau. And um, we think that uh, these singularities uh, that we find arise because of the large charge N in the Klebanov Stressler throat. And this uh, charge leads to a too large variation of the warp factor in the bulk, which uh, in the end has the effect that these singularities are created. Um, yeah, we also uh, talked a bit uh, about possible ways to escape this conclusion. Uh, I think uh, it will be difficult, but uh, uh, it will still be worthwhile to, to look uh, for possibilities. So one thing is, uh, as we discussed, uh, these, I would call them ungeneric models where uh, specific uh, geometries can avoid the parametrics. And uh, another thing that would be interesting to investigate uh, is uh, this particular set of models with a large number of Kähler moduli and uh, a large D7 tadpole. Uh, perhaps one can find an argument which excludes such models, or uh, perhaps uh, there are actually explicit models uh, realizing this uh, would be very interesting to understand this better. And uh, finally, uh, I um, only briefly mentioned at the very beginning of the large volume scenario, which is also a very uh, popular uh, uh, scenario for the sitter constructions. Um, and uh, the large volume scenario appears to avoid uh, this singular bulk problem, essentially because the volume is exponentially large there. So you uh, don't expect that uh, large warping effects uh, do some harm. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we uh, take uh, uh, things like the Sitter conjecture uh, uh, seriously, then we might uh, also uh, think that there could be some other hidden problems somewhere uh, in this construction. And it would certainly be worthwhile to 
look into this in more detail and try to understand whether there's some other or some, some similar problem uh, in uh, these constructions, which uh, have the effect that in the end, uh, they are not consistent and prevent explicit models. Okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to say. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. So we had a lot of questions and discussions.